but things like emulating touch events, emulating uh, and spoofing, geolocation, um, these are all in the browser now too. So there's, there's a good amount that you can get away with um, on desktop before you go to the device to make sure that your per performance goals are being met too. So I'd add that in. Right. So I think one of the things we're missing here are the audiences for testing. Right. I mean, your workflow sounds very developer-centric, like you want to ma make sure that the CSS and the UX is perfect. The people that tend to use WebDriver tend to be more interested in the end-to-end -end testing and the functionality of the application, particularly as sort of a workflow or a walkthrough goes. Um, so I probably wouldn't recommend end-to-end -end testers use DevTools because it's not the right hammer to be hitting right. this particular nail with. Um, you know, and it's got to be like, take a look at what, what people are actually attempting to do and their relative skill levels and try and figure out what the best approach is. Um, you know, for a handful of people, being in the dev tools and being highly technical and getting all the metrics out of the browser is entirely the right thing to do. And that's a fantastic option for those people. But, you know, for hundreds of people, for, for a majority of developers, actually it's enough to be able to throw something together with a bit of Python or a small amount of JavaScript and use that to verify that, that the application is doing what it's meant to be doing. Um, so, yeah. Think about the audience of, of who's going to be using this um, and how they're going to be using it and how they're going to be integrating with the team. And it may turn out that actually not being in the browser is, is a better way of going about it. And sometimes, you know, it's going to be better to do things manually. Yeah. Does, like this, does this feel right is a really hard question for a machine to answer, but a really easy question for a person to answer. Can I just tack on to the end of that? Um, yeah. I, I can't remember who the conversations were with, but um, I've got a feeling it might have been Paul like a year ago. Um, web developers don't jump onto the command line as as frequently as like a, a Python developer or a Ruby developer. I mean, I'm comfortable with the command line, but I mean, out of the web developers here, if you're, I mean, you're probably you probably do back server side coding anyway. But hands up, who's pretty comfortable using the command line or coding up? Um, in fact, actually, this, this is a bit of a, thing. <laughs> it's, a it's a technical audience. Yeah. In the first place. yeah. <laughs> Uh, load a question uh, and so on and so forth. But okay, you know, there's that question as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it seems like having a, a huge number of mobile devices is the only way to reliably test on Android and Blackberry. Is there any hope of having accurate, reliable emulators for platforms other than iOS? I would add iOS to that list as well. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? So is, is there any hope for having really reliable emulators? No. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> Just um, to give Opera props, isn't uh, the Opera emulator kind of exact, isn't supposed to be exactly the same as Opera Mobile? Yeah. yeah. Backed up. But it doesn't, obviously doesn't have the same fonts as Rabbit device. Okay. So. I th I th hmm? Yeah. Web OS. Is good. Web OS. <laughs> I th yeah, I think you could say that, you know, the, there is hope that they'll get it all, that they'll get better. Um, I would expect those vendors to, to put support into those tools, so yeah. Right. I, uh, more optimistically than just a flat no, I think the Pareto principle is going to kick in here, the 80-20 rule. You know, but testing on a simulator or an emulator is going to be fairly close and in the common case actually enough for our, our testing needs, but there's always going to be some weird quirk in the hardware um, that we're going to need the devices for. So are the emulators going to get enough where it'll move from the 80-20 to 90-10 or 95-5? I don't know. Um, but having seen the progress of the Android emulator, which has gone from being quite painful to use to actually being good enough to do a majority of my testing on, uh, particularly with the Intel uh, version that, that's available now, yeah, I'm, I'm actually relatively hopeful about hitting like the 90-10 point. Excellent. Okay. Question over back. Yep. I just want to give a shout out to OpenDeviceLab.com, which is actually opening device labs all over the world right now. They got 40 locations. One of them is a Mozilla office. Google is think, thinking about it. So if you've got hardware that you don't use, you can donate it to one of them, and every developer can go there and try on real devices to play with their things. Because we can make emulators as much as we want. <coughs> Most of the errors come through touching and playing with the thing yes. on the real hardware. I mean, when we in, when when I put Firefox OS on uh, on S2s, three devices, same device, completely different results. So it's 
it's, it's not that easy, but Open Device Lab is a really, really good idea for people that can't afford all these phones to actually play with them in an, in an office that is a sharing space, and there's lots and lots of them worldwide. So just wanted to mention that. There's also, um, th I mean, they also have a lot of information for people that want to set up their own device labs, too, um, and community support for that. I also, uh, if I'm passing a phone shop, I'll just go in and have a play, see what's going on. And uh, I recommend you do too, because the important thing to know is what's in the shop is what somebody could potentially be using like to access your site. So that's a great idea of what exactly is going on in the, in the market. And obviously, it's going to be market specific, but you'd be surprised at some of the travesties that are in phone shops nowadays. So, yeah. Um, really quick. Uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, most of the emulator execution is somewhere else in the stack. There's a great company which has proven that they can run ARM code on x86 faster than ARM executes on ARM. So obviously the problem isn't with the ARM device or this instruction set. It's somewhere in the stack to get these mm -hmm. emulators up and running. Most of the time it's a balance between the teams trying to get their products out the door versus actually caring about, or to put it in a correct terminology since we're about to have beers, giving enough shits. Uh, about getting their emulators up and running. So if this is something that matters to web dev as a whole, you should definitely be putting more pressure on these uh, on these manufacturers to get their emulators up to speed to do things. So, yeah, excellent. Okay, so let's switch gears a bit. Okay, here's one of my questions. Will we get a solution for package management and module loading soon? There have been several tools that have shown that it can be done but there's no real consensus. And will ECMA Squared 6 module solve this? And Addy corrected me, so these are actually two questions in one. And package management is somewhat separate from module loading. So this is a real problem for a lot of developers. And Paul, perhaps you can start with this. <sighs> sure. Um, uh, so right now in client-side package management, uh, there's a few possibilities. Um, there, a while ago, there was a project called Ender, um, and the people who made Ender decided that it didn't really work out, so that's mostly dead. Uh, there's also Volo, uh, made by James Burke, who made who created um, Require.js, which is pretty cool. Uh, Bower, uh, originally released by Twitter, um, and there's also uh, a lot of folks using NPM, sending it through Browserify, um, and getting it to work there. And uh, these are all kind of using different registry approaches, uh, different ideas on, on should we start an entire new uh, JavaScript library ecosystem from scratch, or use one that's already available? Do we, use, do we just accept that we can use node packages inside the browser um, and make that work? Um, and, and it's a little, it's, it's kind of messy right now. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm most excited about what's happening with the Bower project. Um, it has about 900 packages in it, um, all working. Dependency resolution works fantastic. You actually get updated um, inside the UI when, uh, when a JavaScript library ships a new version, so it just kind of keeps you up to date. Um, and, uh, but uh, there, there's a lot of challenges because package management for client side is something where, like, it's useful when it hits a critical mass, and and I don't think we're we're there yet. So I'm looking forward to kind of um, seeing what we can do either inside this tool or another tool to kind of get there. Because without it, um, without package management client side, like everyone's going to be afraid of calling jQuery a dependency. And jQuery, you know, is is already too big. So uh, it could have been smaller had we had proper package management. Um, and I think it would really open up a, a lot of progress and forward momentum in what we're able to get away with on the front end uh, when we can actually create reasonable dependencies. So is this a problem where, at one point, standardizations should come in? Alex? <laughs> you want to talk about ES6 modules? 